If you've ever wondered what the cross-section is between the National Political Forum and your personal life, I'd encourage you to look no further than your dining room table. I want to talk to you today about this little epicenter, this important place as one of the few where we are not only forced to communicate with our opposing views, but to love those who hold them. In other words, what I'm about to tell you is more like a multi-step manuscript on how to deal with the not-so-awesome political views of the uncle at dinner parties and how to turn him into the optimal opportunity of personal and political growth. If you don't have that uncle at your dinner parties, then he was either estranged long ago, or he's anyone in your personal life whose views just don't align with yours. We all have someone who we disagree with, but spending some time communicating with them is essential to our growth. The phenomenon of political polarization a small subsection of the larger psychological tendency towards group polarization is no joke. We copy and paste familiar political views and then bold and italicize them with each additional mention. It is an ever-present psychological structure and none of us can hold ourselves above it. It is the result of holding steadfast in your views as some kind of ultimate truth. It's exacerbated both by support and rejection of your beliefs, but then how do we prevent it? I'd suggest a good old middle path, the road less taken in politics. An essential method of combat towards political polarization is what I feel to be its very antithesis, political socialization. And here's the part where you all think to yourself, how could we possibly socialize about politics any more than we already are? Well, according to a University of Denmark study, we're currently doing a pretty awful job of it. The survey studied the political orientation of its par participants, their perceived political distance from their relatives, and their subsequent frequency of political discussion with these people. Participants were then rated on a general political activity and tolerance scale. Researchers concluded what we recognize in our own lives. Participants who felt as though they were politically distant from their relatives were less likely to discuss politics with these people. Makes sense. But these same individuals were also rated relatively low on a scale of general tolerance comparative to people who did discuss politics. The same people who were unwilling to discuss politics with their politically distant relatives were also less likely to exhibit this tolerance in their non-familial lives. Considering that a lack of tolerance is one of the many plagues of our current political climate, perhaps it's time to trace this intolerance back to that within our personal circles because there are many ways to productively discuss politics, but high up on your list of priorities should be the following. One, cultivating transparency. Two, practicing introspectivity. And three, speaking productively. First step is in your willingness to be transparent about your disagreement in the first place. Second, but equally as important, is being skeptical of assumptions that your brain makes about that uncle upon disagreement. And lastly, is keeping nothing more than an arm's distance away from a productive discussion at all times. Productive discussion looks nothing like climbing up on your high horse and yelling downwards. It's more like placing out a few handholds, laying down a path towards a neutral zone in the form of facts or similarities. Productive argumentation is not a conversion tactic, but it is rooted in empathy and is therefore sustainable and oftentimes game-changing because we sure are talking about politics, just not with the right people and not in the right ways. We're ignoring the uncle at the dinner party or we're unfollowing him. We're sighing under our breath and we're losing hope in the people that we need to be talking to. At first sight of disagreement, we label that person as a lost cause, uneducated or misled perhaps, and march back to our cozy spot on the better or correct side of the political spectrum. But every time we march back to our friends and family with whom we share similarities, we march away from and therefore strain the common ground that is essential to unified progress. And every time we foster values of feeling good and right, rather than values of transparency and interdependence, we lose sight of the democratic system we belong to in the first place. We live in a hyper-networked world where it is easier than ever to find a niche of beliefs parallel to your own. Our social media feeds, our group chats, and our subsequent lives are likely one set of beliefs, bouncing off each other and amplifying with every point of contact. So consider every dinner party, every confrontation with someone in your inner circle, but not in your ideological one, 
to be the ultimate opportunity, the one place where you're set up perfectly to meet in the middle. I came across a quote about a year or so back by an author, Mark Manson, who stated that part of living in a democracy and a free society is that we all have to deal with the views and people that we don't necessarily like. That's simply the price we pay. You could even say it's the whole point of the system. Because when I say me in the middle, I'm not telling you you ought to set up camp and stay there. I'm not encouraging you to become any less passionate about your political views. But this middle place, even if temporary, is a place of growth. It's a place where we can learn even if we can't fully understand. And if you're unwilling to meet your uncle there at holiday parties, how do you expect the larger nation to cultivate any kind of unified progress? We compose a hefty percentage of this nation, but millions of versions of our uncles compose the other half of it. Take the compassion you likely have for your family, consciously maintain it amidst disagreement, and then generalize this practice to the members of this nation that we aren't biologically programmed to love. The conclusion of the Denmark study cited the reason for a lack of tolerance to be a consequence of negative experiences from prior discussions. When political discussions turn into a fixed pattern of disagreement, there's a tendency to withdraw from the discussion. Let's look at that last sentence again. When political discussions turn into a fixed pattern of disagreement, there's a tendency to withdraw from the discussion. That sentence is equally as applicable to a national scale as a familial one. Our very country has fallen into a fixed pattern of disagreement, the pattern often being almost as damaging as the content being disagreed on. So while you can, and probably should be angered about politics, this cannot be cited as reason to withdraw from the exchange of productive contrasting beliefs. Not with your uncle, not with your friends, and certainly not with the larger form of politics. Thank you.